Good afternoon. Um, I think we may as well start. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Julie Wedgwood. Um, I have a particular interest in storytelling and video. Um, and uh, I also have uh, Gemma Critchley and Dr. Mark Davis with us to share what they know. And uh, I've just been asking Mark how he wants me to introduce him to you. And the conclusion we came to was, he's a doctor, he's ginger, and he knows an awful lot about telling stories with video. <laughs> Mark. Oh, <is> that... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right, let's see if this works. Um, I've got a bit of a confession to make because um, the thing that I love most about my job is making people cry. And um, the best example where I made people cry was in a hospice, which sounds really, really bad. Um, but it was for this film. Um, it was a learning video as an induction film and it was holding up a mirror to the organisation and just saying, you know, showing what, what happens there for new starters. And when they played it back, um, there was... You know, you've, you've got the, the, the healthcare professionals that work in that organisation in tears. And they don't do that every day. They don't do that when they're on the, on the front line. You know, they're, they're professional. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they don't feel. But, you know, so, so when, when, they, when there was all these tears in, this, in, the, in, the, in the training room, it was the best form of pay, payment and feedback you can get because you know that you've engaged people at a really, really kind of deep level and that they take stuff from that. Um, and that's the power of... Uh, video in the power of story. Um, so, in this talk, like if you're here to kind of get an understanding of how to use actors and how to do scripted stuff and how to, you know, um, do sort of Hollywood kind of epics, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed because um, both what myself and Gemma are really, really passionate about is authenticity and expertise and keeping things relevant. And never before has there been an opportunity for organisations of all sizes to be able to either create their, their own content or um, the ability to do it has become a lot more affordable that as well. So it's all about off the, so it's no longer about off the shelf video content. It's about creating stuff that's relevant to your organisation. So it's a, it's a really good time. But before I go into that, I'm gonna talk, I was on the fence about doing this, about talking a bit about my journey and how it connects to video, but through that, there's this, you'll get a sense of why I'm so passionate about storytelling in video. So, um, in 1991, <laughs> I was 16, uh, watching this documentary on TV called Under the Sun, and it was about the Dogon, and that's a tribe in Africa. It was my first introduction into anthropology. Now, when I was um, a kid, we lived in Cyprus and, for a while, and I had this sense of you know, otherness and other cultures and different people, and I was absolutely fascinated, and I'd never heard about anthropology. So I did a bit of research into it, and then, um, found out that it was like an academic discipline and you had to have you know, your A-levels and your degree to do it. And I had three GCSEs, so it was like a door that shut in my face. But what it really enthused me about it was you know, the power of storytelling in film. Um, I prefer film because I'm a bit of a snob. Some people, this video is a buzz term. But, um, and so fast forward four years and I found out about these access courses that you could do to take you to university if you wanted to achieve. Um, which I, so the minute I heard about them, I signed up with the full intention of you know, following that, that dream about using video to tell stories in a learning capacity. And that ended up in more in sort of the academic sense but over the last sort of two or three years in um, corporations and charities. Um, but that whole thing that fueled it was just the, the belief in video to, to, to create change for people. And as with a lot of things, I met a woman um, that totally changed things for me. And... Uh, Remarkable woman. We, we never actually had a conversation, but this is her. So, what I love about this, this is a photograph. It's a woman who was in the Royal Geographical Society Illustrated. And it, this was taken in, 1930, in the 1930s in Burma, completely different continent, thousands of miles away, a long time ago. And what struck me about this photograph was that in that image, you just get a sense of her. You just, you know, even though it was taken so long ago, that energy is still there. You still feel it, and it's amazing. And it told me what is lacking in, you know, it pointed to sort of like the lack of video. I wanted to know like what she believed in, what she felt, you know, how she walked, how she sounded, how she carried herself, you know, her passions, her travels. You know, there's a sense that there's stuff that you could take that would that she would give that would that you could learn from. And that emphasised even more the importance of telling stories in video and experience, which, again, slightly biased coming from an anthropological point of view. So I ended up specialising in visual anthropology 
And ironically, um, my PhD was all about family photos and family relationships and change. And again, that's stories, in the, oh, objects, inf <coughs> excuse me, objects infused with stories. And stories are everywhere. They're, um, we can find them in books, in objects, in buildings, in places, the stories we tell others about ourselves, the stories that they tell about us, and the stories that we tell ourselves as well. And um, so stories are everywhere, and they're, they're so important. And um, I think this is a bit of an early take-home. I'll we'll do some take-homes later on, so how you can take stuff back to your organisation and do this yourself. But um, never try... A lot of academics like models. They like to sort of like draw diagrams and explain, overcomplicate things sometimes, and explain what something is. And you get that with story. There's all these elaborate sort of pathways of what makes the perfect story. And I just think a story should just be felt. You'll know it by if it feels right. And like the Vikings had that thing, they, the, the rune stones in the bag, and you'd put your hand in the bag and keep feeling around until you found one that just felt like it belonged in your palm. And it's the same with storytelling. You know, if you don't get that sort of those goosebumps or you don't get that thing that makes you know that that story is going to give something, it's not the right story. So just, it's all about, um, about looking and finding the right thing. And stories aren't a place for rhetoric. They're not a place for hard, cold, hard, cold facts. And I think ultimately... Um, stories about, are about emotion, and they should stir us at some level. They should just kind of add that difference. And this isn't to say that you shouldn't have, um, you know, cut, hold, cut, card hold, hard, cold facts don't belong in L&D. Of course they do. But what I'm saying is, as well as that, have something that just takes you beyond that, that gives it something that's, that's real and authentic and just adds that something extra. Um, so, Hassan did this really, really cool um, experiment a few years ago, and they put two people in um, different MRI scanners, and in these MRI scanners you had the storyteller and the recipient, they didn't know each other, and the storyteller was, um, gave a sort of, it was an experiential based story, and um, what happened was, whilst the MRI scanner picked up sort of their brain waves through them recounting this experience. But the remarkable thing was that the recipient of the story, the person that was listening, um, the same parts of the brain were igniting at the, same, at the same time whilst they were recounting the story, which is remarkable that they couldn't see each other. They weren't, there wasn't any like, non-verbal communication there or anything like that. And um, yeah, it was having that impact, which says so much about what stories do. And this is why stories have been so fundamentally at the, sort of, at the heart of humanity. They are what make, make us human. You know, it's how we learn. It's how, how societies and cultures and everything kind of has come together. Because obviously, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, that's all we had. That's how information was sort of portrayed, p p passed on. So they're the, fabric of, they're the fabric of identity and the core of how we learn. Um, I want to just talk briefly about L&D. and um, because I think I've got a lot of friends and colleagues and clients that, that are in L&D, and there's a sense that it's changing, that things are moving, that that's very te technology-led. Um, you know, you, you've got MOOCs, you've got that throwing people a curveball, you've got mobile learning, on-demand learning, that sense that pe more learning is taking place outside of the training room. And you know, some people have even spoken about, is the training room ever going to, you know, it, can we see the end of the training room coming? I don't think it will be, but... What I'm trying to make the point is, is that, if that regardless of if, if it's true, if we're seeing more and more learners learning in isolation, then where, where's the humanity in that? Where's the, the sort of that face-to-face -face contact? Where's the emotion, the stuff that you get in the training room, the stuff that you get through face-to-face? -face? And I think video can help fill, fill that gap with stories. It just helps people sort of, it gives deeper content. Um, right, so I'm going to go into the, some take-homes now things that hopefully, if you guys want to go back into your, to your organisations and see, you know, use this, and some of them are practical and some of them are how to plan it and to roll it out. So the first thing to do is to find your story. And like I said earlier on, it's like looking beyond the facts, look at it. A lot of people make the mistake of, they'll create, they'll create some, some learning content, and then at the end of it they'll say, oh, do you know what, we'll do a video of that. And they kind of plug it in at the end. And... More, more often than not, they end up with a video version of the core learning content, and it doesn't add anything. It's just, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, 
better to have it than not, I suppose, but it doesn't add anything. I think when it comes to the design of the content, when it comes to, to sort of creating it, think from the beginning, can you build a video into it? And as you'll see later on, the ability to build a video into it is really, really affordable, really, really accessible. I think also, you know, I've been talking here about hospices and, you know, loads of deep and meaningful stuff, but don't be afraid of humour. Don't be afraid of... It doesn't have to be like a tearjerker every time you do a story about accountancy or something like that, you know. But, but here's the point about, account about, about numbers. Numbers are meaning. So if you work in an organisation where there's numbers, you know, look behind those numbers, because they mean something. There's a hard, there's, there's, there's like a soft aspect to that. And um, I spoke to an accountant want, account want, once, because about 30% of what I do now is like, 70% is L&D, &D, but 30% of it's still marketing. And he spoke to me about a marketing video. He said, but I'm an accountant, what can I do? All I do is type in numbers. Well, I said, no, what you do is enable people, you secure their futures, it's about family, it's about, there's so much more to it than just those numbers. And um, so it kind of, he was on board with it. So I don't think that every story's got to be, got to be serious. Planning. I think when you come to the planning, like the two of the most important things are who's going to tell the story, and that's where you sort of do your research, find the right story, like I said before. But equally as important is who's going to ask the story. Because there's this... I'm in two, kind of two minds about this. Say if you've got somebody in your department who has, who has got a really cool story that can, you can bring in to... For, for learning, and um, every, you know, everybody knows the story in the department. If you sit them down and film them, and you're you know, one of those people who knows this person is going to ask, ask the questions, sometimes there's a sense that you're going through the motions because you know that they know it. And, but if you get somebody in who doesn't know that person, maybe from a different department or whatever, or externally, then there's that freshness with telling the story, and sometimes that can make quite a big difference to how it, how it comes out. Because that interview context is a conversation, and that's how it should be. It shouldn't, no, don't get people to talk to the camera because it becomes really pitchy. It becomes like, like you're being, not like you're being salty, but it's, it's a whole different dynamic. It takes, I, I, I've I filmed people before who can stand up like this and talk for, you know, 50, 25 minutes and ace it, but the minute you put a camera in front of them, they can't even get their name and their job title out. And so it's like, it, it can be quite a scary experience for people. So it's about having a conversation. I think I've spoken about the design bit. So, um, but on, on that note about design as well, actually, I would say don't overcomplicate it. You know, I think we're, um, I think we're just starting to learn how to use video, be it from a marketing perspective or be it from an L&D perspective. And a big thing that I'm a, I'm a really big fan of layering stuff. So say if, you film, say if you've got a story that's like, I don't know, a video that's like 10 minutes long, I mean, usually kind of five minutes is sort of a bit of a maximum, but there's a lot of people say that you should only go for like a minute and a half. That, that, that's the marketing department talking because they're worried that they're going to drop off. I'm of the belief that if somebody's invested in the content, they're going to stay with you. So, you know, don't be too put off about making videos that are a little bit longer. But at the same side, at the same time, look at layering it through the web page because what, what inspired me to do visual anthropology, which is the study of tribes and cultures and civilizations through visual media, through film and through text and through photography, was just as I kind of got to the MA point, that's when all of these multimedia was becoming a lot more accessible and you could put text and audio and pictures and video next to each other and that I just think is like the real magic. That's where you've got all of those different kind of modes of representation and that can just take, it can all plug in, you've got the power of the word, you've got the power of the image, you've got audio, you've got the emotive stuff that all fits in with that. So by layering the content through your mood or how, however you're, you're, you're um, presenting it is a really, really good way. And also I think avoid buzzword, buzz, buzzword. Stories aren't the place for rhetoric. Stories aren't the place for kind of selling at people. They're about the soft side, you know, the, the humanity, the, the emotional stuff, the experiential stuff. So now I'm going to go into the equipment that you need um, to tell the stories within your organisation. I know some of you will probably have your own internal video boffs and they'll have all their big, amazing cameras. Some of you won't. Some of it, a lot of the time, with this, the way I'm going to look at it is about smartphones. 
and there's a saying that the best camera that you've got is the camera that's in your pocket. And smartphones are amazing. When I was a kid, we used to have Swiss Army knives, and they were, um, they were great. They did everything that you wanted, wanted to do. And that's what smartphones are like. You know, they've got, you can write notes on them, you can, you can film on them, you can take photographs, you can storyboard, you can even text and ring people sometimes, apparently. But there's just like, they're really, really cool. And the quality of the images, especially on like the more recent ones, you get really, really good quality. So I want to talk you through the kit that you'll need to, if you want to, use smartphones within your organization to tell stories. And the beauty of that is, who here doesn't have a smartphone? Nobody, <laughs> see? Great question. <laughs> so, um, so everybody's got them. So that means from a sort of like, from the perspective of getting loads and loads of people in your organization involved, you know, there's no excuses, so they have to. <laughs> but um, when you're going to start filming, the most crucial thing, I'm going to check the guys in the back of the film and see if they're going to agree with me, but um, is audio. So you can, have, you can have bad audio and a great picture, no. You can have good audio and a bad picture, it's not ideal, but that's better than having the previous one, but ideally obviously you want is good audio and a good picture. But audio is where the information is coming through, so it's essential. This is a Rode Smart Lab, so it plugs into the bottom of your phone, you put it in your pocket, and it's just like one of these. So it gets the audio right close up to... Um, the, the person on camera and then you put that in your pocket and then hit record and it'll basically record a file onto your smartphone that you can then sync up in the edit <coughs> to, to to sync up the sound of the text so and it's it's amazing i think it's like 25 quid but if you're writing this down and you're interested in that it's make sure you put road smart lab plus because the plus it's the latest one it's eliminated some hiss that was in the previous versions secondly stabilization um really important for talking head, you know, for storytelling, talking head videos too. Um, this is an amazing tripod, the Koenig. Um, you can see the guy at the back, he's shaking his head. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> but tripods can, like, cost thousands of pounds. This one's amazing because it's 110, 120 quid. I'm selling them after the event, I'm joking. But um, it's about 110, 120 pounds. But what's good is it's really, really sturdy, um, but the movement's fluid. So if you want to start filming cutaways or, you know, extra clips that will plug into, like B-roll as it's called, to plug into the story, then that's a really good piece of kit to have. If you've got a tripod that's like 15, 20 quid for photography, it's not going to do the job. Because it's going to be, if you touch it, it's going to wobble. And um, so, so it's a really good one to buy that. The Glyph, be really careful if you Google that. Don't put Gilf, it's something completely different. Um, so <laughs> I have no idea what it is. But if you... Um, this enables you to attach the tripod to, the, to the, the, the smartphone to the tripod. And so it'll just plug into the, you screw it onto the base plate, and then it'll go. That'll fit everything up to, to beyond an iPhone 6 Plus, so even with a case. So it's a really, really good thing to have. And from that, you've got your, you've got your um, everything that you need. That's all it is. Right there, I don't think that would even break 200 quid. So it's really, you know, it's, it's really, really affordable, really accessible. And as you skill up, as more people get involved, as the wider organization kind of buys into it, then um, you, know, you can maybe get new kit. You know, get that. The only thing this won't do is, like you see a lot of films nowadays, which we'll see in a minute, um, we get a lot of depth of field. It won't give that cinematic look. But you can even attach lenses to them and things. I think there's adapters that you can get. So this is a really good base point to start off from. So I'm going to... Um, talk about framing interviews now, and this is sort of like an essential bit. I'm being a bit cheeky, okay, so um, there's an organisation called Charity Learning Consortium, it's sort of like a little plug for them. This video is really related to what I'm talking about, but today it's their launch event for Give Back UK, and what they've done is get loads of um, L&D professionals and thought leaders together to create content um, to roll out to charities to give them access to the kind of expertise that they wouldn't get. Um, we, we did this teaser video for them early on in the year, and the reason why I'm showing this is because it shows you, you'll see very, very quickly how interviews are framed, because what you've got, you've got people looking across the camera into this, across this dead space, and that's what you, that's, you know, how you would frame an interview, unless you're getting all arty. Um, go ahead if you want to do it, but that, that's like a classic interview thing, and it's, you triangulate the eye line. You make sure that you're sitting on the same level as... If you imagine that the, the camera is a lens, you've got... Sorry, the camera is, a, is an eye, 
make sure that they're all on the same level. So you've got the camera, you've got the person that's being interviewed, and then you've got the, the interviewer. So if, that, if they're all level, then you've got this like triang triangulation thing going on. The closer the interviewer comes to the camera, it's going to reduce the angle, and so it's going to make it for a slightly more intimate kind of, kind of feel. So, but you'll get a sense here of how it is. So each one is like framed in that way. But um, so that, that'll, hopefully that gives you a sense of how to frame an interview up. And um, I hope you guys, guys don't mind me plugging CRC, but they're doing some really, really cool work in this, their launch event today. And I thought that was an absolutely relevant video for, t for today as well. So I had to, because I filmed it all. Um, so when you've got your, your setup, the other thing to think of is lights. Now, working on the basis that you don't have big snazzy lights, um, a really cool friend is a window. So say the window's here, you put the camera facing into the room, and the person being on camera facing towards the window, and that will just bring in the natural light. If you've got, like, I'm not going to use the word voile. I don't think I've ever used the word voile in a presentation before. But if you, if you use voile curtains, it will soften the light down a bit. Um, if you're going to do that, check the sky and make sure that there's no clouds breaking. Because if, if, if you've got, like, constant light, then that's, that's a good friend. If you've got um, kind of cloud, if, if it's really overcast, then that's good. But if you've got clouds breaking, it's going to send the exposure up and down. So look at what's going on outside the window. Um, the location, what we did with Charity Learning, we've, we were turning up to places like today where we've been filming, and you kind of, you get what you're given. And at first we did it, and we were trying to sort of make it look like a studio, and make it look film against backdrops, but we were renting out offices, and there were bangs going on and stuff like this, and we just thought, do you know what, let's just turn the camera around so you can see, you can see the cafe where we film people. You can see you lot walking around and learning technologies. And it makes it look cool because it gives it that sense of place, and it just it, it works really, really well because it's that thing about authenticity, and it's important. And it also means that you don't have to worry about hiring a studio and blowing your budget and everything. Um, Noise is a big one, but again, don't worry about sort of, you know, a bit of a hum in the background. If you've got, you know, the, the cleaner comes in hoovering, then obviously shut it down for a little, for a little bit. But, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be like an epically produced production. It's, you know, make it the best you can, considering those aspects of light, of audio, of um, the framing, and then you'll be, you'll be there. And the final thing, I think, as well, is don't forget the music. Music can really, really, really just transform, transform a production and really just take it to a whole other level. And sometimes you don't need music, sometimes there's not a place for it, but um, it's, I think the right music can really, really just take it. To, I think quite often, I, with videos that I've made before where people have been in tears, it's the choice of the music that's helped take that across. And um, the two places that are great for this is the music bed is the new kind of stuff. I think it's been around for about two years, but I mean, the quality of the stuff that you can get there is just, I mean, this is from the music bed, and it's just amazing. Um, iStock Audio as well, um, they, they do like a lot of really, really good tracks too. But it's just finding that, in the same way that you look for the story and you try and find the story, look for the right audio. Don't go to like, don't get anything don't get any kind of corporate cheesy stuff. I know you like corporates, but just stay away from it because nobody needs any high-octane electric guitars to know that you're talking about hope and future and ambition and dreams. Um, so, yeah, don't forget the music. I think I'm done. Oh, thank you. I was just about to ask you to stop. <laughs> it took me 28 minutes when I did my run-through today, so I don't know where I've got the five minutes from. I've probably missed loads of really important points. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I found that fascinating. I don't know about you. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Mark immediately now before we move on to Gemma's presentation? No. No, but I've, 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 seen, I've seen, seen it being used. But it's one of those things I, I really want to, but I've never had a chance to kind of do it. But I mean, again, you know, same principle, stories to, you know, to deliver learning. So, but yeah. Hey. How much 
how much do I think about cinematography? Um, I think it's always, it's like getting, getting a good frame is always important. And I think as you grow as a filmmaker, it's like when you start off, you'll go for very, you know, as you get more confident, you'll start experimenting more. And but sometimes the problem is like you, you have this really cool idea, but the client is scared of it because it's like a little bit out there. Um, but I think cinematography is, I mean, personally, I love it. And, you know, I think sometimes the challenge is to, when you're doing a lot of talking head videos, is how to make them as nice as possible. And that's, that's the difference between filming on the smartphones versus filming on um, where you've got interchangeable lenses and depth of field. That's what really makes something kind of cinematic in a sense. But we don't, don't underestimate smartphones. I mean, there's a whole market around, you know, pimping them up so they can do really cool things. And you've got, there's, there's a, I should have put it on the kit list actually, there's an item. So gimbals are the newest, like you've got drones, which are pretty cool. But gimbals, they're, they're gimbal operators, they have gimbals in them as well. But um, gimbals are a big thing. So they just make the, the cameras kind of like glide through the air. But there's one for the, for the iPhone now. So you can pop this thing on a handle and like walk through with an iPhone, it just glides. So when you get to that point where you're taking stuff beyond beyond the beyond the interview and you want to film stuff that kind of connects with that like you know people living their lives or portraits or whatever those things are really really good because it adds that sort of cinema the cinematography to it adds that kind of epic vibe to it and things so yeah there's just one more question there yeah Yeah so, break it, yeah, so breaking the video up, so, um, so say if you're d doing a piece of content that's, you know, on your Moodle and it's about a given topic and you've got, you've got like a lot of written, written stuff and pictures, so in the design of it, look at what, look at the, the other aspects, the, the written aspects, the, the stuff that you've, that's going to be on the Moodle and look at how video can connect with that. So instead of hitting somebody with like a 10 minute video, sort of, in the edit, slice that up and place it around the rest of the content. So it makes it more sort of digestible, more, you know, the whole bite-sized mm -hmm. buzzword. But it just, it makes it, and, and then you can, you can plug the video in more to the relevant context around the, the, the written learning. And so I think it, it creates a nice balance. And that's the thing that really excites me. It just, you know, kind of makes it all seamless. And that's the beauty about multimedia, I think. So, cheers. That's great. Well, Mark, thank you very much. We're going to have some time for some other questions later after Gemma's done uh, her presentation. But for now, thank you very much, Mark. <laughs>